Um, and thanks to OWASP and AppSec Cali for uh, the invitation to speak here. Thank you for your time today. I hope you're all enjoying the, the wonderful weather we were blessed with. Uh, I originally started uh, modeling this presentation with some gag jokes about the National Lampoon's mo uh, movie, European Vacation, but then I realized I might be dating myself and many people wouldn't get it, so I kind of limited those. I contemplated showing you a bunch of pictures of my European vacations, but I thought that might just be rubbing things in or something at some point, so I, I kept them to a minimum, but not zero. So um, two of these things are true. One's, one's a blatant ripoff from uh, Tony Stark. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so everything I tell you here, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't try to defend yourself in court with anything that I, that I uh, tell you today, um, and I don't want to be on the hook for it either. Um, I'm the director of security at Tinder. Uh, we're here in, in West Hollywood. Um, you're all welcome to come and uh, hang out with us sometime. We are part of the people who run the DC 310 group that we're, we're getting started, getting off the ground here in LA. So um, you, know, you can follow us on Twitter or wherever um, if you want to get involved with that. Um, that supposedly says, who am I in French? I just trust Google Translate, did, did a good job there. Um, so what is GDPR? Uh, in essence, it's a US, uh, sorry, <laughs> screwed up the first thing. Uh, EU privacy law um, that goes into effect where they're actually enforcing it uh, 525 of this year. So if you don't know what it is and you have anything considered like personal information in your environments for users, you're probably behind the eight ball uh, in, terms of, in terms of time. Uh, it applies to any third party or any parties who are processing data on EU residents. I'll, I'll leave it up to your lawyers to define residents. Um, uh, it's actually kind of a hard thing to do from a product standpoint to, to ask uh, to derive whether or not someone's a resident of a certain place. Like you can do, you can do uh, GOIP, you can do look at their GPS coordinates, or you could pop up a box and say, are you an EU resident? But most products don't want to go that route, right? Um, the penalties for non-compliance in GDPR are severe. Um, you could say uh, it's roughly 4% of your global revenue for a company. Uh, and the, the one thing about that, uh, it's pretty quantifiable. So unlike PCI or SOX compliance, uh, you, you literally can say, you know, here's our budget that, you know, we can work in to say, like, we don't comply. This is the number that we're going to potentially lose, right? Uh, my understanding is that member states can also go after you independently, so it could actually get higher than that. But it's something like 20, uh, anyway, it's roughly 4%, so uh, as, as stated in the, in the regulation. Um, it's an attempt by Europe to standardize the uh, law across all the EU countries, and uh, it basically creates sort of a privacy bill of rights for EU uh, residents. Um, quick overview of the rights. They're, they're all detailed uh, in, the, in the regulation, but basically the idea is to give people greater control over their data and how it's used. Um, we'll get into what their data actually means in a moment, but essentially, um, we're required as uh, processors or uh, users of their data, um, to, to put it uh, in blayman's terms, uh, to, to inform them what we're collecting from them, why we're collecting it, how we're using it, who we're sharing with, who we're sharing it with, if we are, uh, and for what purposes. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, required to allow them to request that the information be corrected if they find a, a some sort of error in it uh, that they ask they can ask us to delete it and we have to respect that um, they can opt out of certain parts of how we use the data like I don't want to be marketed to right um, the other thing that they do I'll get into it more about the data portability but essentially you have to be able to provide them with all of the data like literally give them a file with all the data that you have on them um, that has a good uh, impact from a privacy perspective as a consumer, but a bad impact, uh, or potentially bad impact um, as, as a creator of an application, maintainer of an application, especially when, uh, when you factor in the security implications of that. Um, so GDPR, uh, you're all used to saying PII, right? Like personal identifiable information. And generally you have two buckets of PII, right? You have things that are clearly PII, right? I'm Anthony Trummer, my social security number is X or, or whatever, maybe it's an email address, whatever falls in that bucket. And then you have this other bucket of PII, which is basically things that I can put together to figure out who you are, right? 
if I could say like, uh, uh, you know, the bald uh, six, close to six foot tall guy in this room, and I can put together that they're probably talking about me, right? Um, I don't need to know all those other personal details to isolate me, and online is the same kind of way, right? Um, so uh, they have this expanded view of that that, that goes beyond personal information, PII, into what they cons consider personal information. So it could be things that aren't necessarily identifiable, but they're about you, right? Um, this could be how many times you've logged into the app, for example, like who you've connected with. Maybe you're uh, a fictitious or a made up example might be like your score in your video game right now might be information about you. Um, there's all kinds of things. Purchase history in an application, where you logged in from over time, those sorts of things might all be uh, personal information, but not necessarily PII. Um, so one question we had when we were going through this is what constitutes your data, right? So if I message you, right, and then you message me back, is your response back to me my data or is it your data, right? And if it's your data, then, then, then that means that the receivers, it's the receiver's data, right? But then that means that the message I sent to you is not mine anymore, right? Wh which is true, right? Which, which one, I'm not, I'm, not stating, I'm not stating that it's true. I'm saying I don't know which is true, right? That's something for your lawyers to kind of iron out. Um, also, uh, at Tinder, we have uh, internal like mechanisms of how we sort of like, for lack of a better term, rate people uh, uh, in different ways. And you might have some proprietary algorithms that you use to process people's data. And you might feel like you're compelled to divulge some of that information to the public now because it's their data, right? You might arrive at a, let's say, uh, a likability score, like you had something like that in your application, right? Uh, they, maybe it's a, a messaging app and a lot of people like start talking to you, so you seem to be a friendly person and they rate you very highly because you seem to be a friendly person. You might have to divulge some of that information in this process, or at least you're gonna wanna get clarity of, around whether or not that's something you have to divulge. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, I just throw that in there uh, as redundancy. So while Europe is pushing for greater privacy controls for their residents. Uh, the internet looks like this, right? It's just a mess of everybody is trying to, you know, they've got the big data stuff, we've got all the analytics stuff going on. Uh, half the sites you go to anymore, uh, your Facebook feed or something like that, are just nothing but clickbait to show you a thousand ads, and all those ads are sucking out your user agent, your IP address, your, your IDFA or uh, your Apple um, equivalent, yeah, your IDFA or your Android ID things like that um, if you're on mobile. So we're in a world where on one hand, privacy laws are getting stricter, but on the other hand, like everybody's trying to monetize all of your personal data, right? So it gets annoying and it's, it's messy when you look at an example like this where you know there's just uh, all these ads. We've all seen sites like this. So what we're moving towards though is something that looks like this, which is sort of in reverse, right? Now we're gonna have opt-ins. If you've ever traveled to Europe or used a European site, they all have cookie banners, right? We use cookies and we're like, as technologists, we say, yeah, of course you use cookies. How would your site maintain state if you didn't, right? But they're required to put that on there. And if they ask for your uh, GPS location, they're, they're, you get a message pop, uh, pop up for that. But we're gonna start to see more and more I have to explicitly opt in, I have to explicitly opt in. And so it's gonna impact usability from a, from a consumer standpoint. Um, but instead of being like annoying ads, it's gonna be annoying things asking if we can show you this ad or if we can collect this data about you. Um, you're also going to need to track potentially which, pri which version of, of your privacy policy or terms of service did this person opt into over time, so if, if there's ever a dispute over that, you can say, well, you opted in, you, you agreed to version four, and that was covered in version four, and maybe like in version six it's not, or something, or there was some modification to that. So a, as primarily security practitioners, you might be saying like, how does, how does this fit with the security world? Why is security, you know, obviously there are, from uh, encryption standpoints, there's privacy uh, sort of angles of, of uh, we want to ensure uh, insecurity, we want to ensure privacy of, of encrypted m messages. But uh, you'll notice that most of this overlaps with like your GRC policies and procedures already, right? Uh, it's not groundbreaking stuff in terms of the requirements. But there are specific yet vague GDPR requirements around security. As stated, it says something to the effect of, considering the state of the art, you should take reasonable measures 
in relation to the risk associated with the data that you're trying to protect. Right? That's a summarization by a layman, but uh, it's vague. And, and what vague does for me is tell me, A, I can't go to my engineering teams and say, hey, I need you to do this absolutely because this is a requirement. I can say, it feels like it's a requirement. It feels like that's going to meet that bar. But it's also sort of a trap, right? Because when the auditor comes in and says, were you doing sufficient security to, to, to protect this data? It's, it's subjective, right? They could say, no, I don't think you were because I have an extra grind with you, right? So that's sort of a trap for us as, as security folks. Um, and lastly, if, if, you, if your company doesn't have a ded dedicated privacy team, guess who the privacy team is? It's going to be you, right? They're going to, your, your executives are going to look and say, hey, security, privacy, same thing, right? Right? That's probably what they think now, right? Um, I can tell you from our, from our company's perspective, I now have a lawyer on my team, right? Something in, as a security person I never thought would happen, although I was actually quite, um, I advocated for previously because I'm like, I don't really know the law, you know, I'm, I'm, that's not what I do, right? But I actually have a privacy attorney on my team now, which is interesting, along with uh, people who specialize in privacy. So um, there are specific security impacts, and that's partly what I wanted to talk to you guys today about, um, how this is going to impact the, the general security practitioner or leaders in security organizations. So some of the things we'll talk about are the, the, the win of gaining maintain a, uh, sort of complete and maintained data flow mapping so you know where all your stuff is at and what all the stuff you have is. Um, that, that implies proper change control because if that ever changes, you need to know that, right? Um, what happens to the vendors that you integrate with, right? And what are their requirements under GDPR, right? Uh, how that affects your overall security posture in, in the sort of cloud first world that we're in, in most companies. Um, how data, I'll just say it's data life cycle, right? Like how are we gonna manage the data from the, from the moment we get it till the moment we get rid of it? Um, what the impacts of GDPR are on the value of you as a target and what happens if you get breached, right? And then uh, lastly, the do download portal that I alluded to to satisfy the portability requirements. I put yikes there because it's a scary thing as a site operator to have this thing that, I'll get into it a little bit later, but it, it's sort of like a one-stop shop for hackers, right? <laughs> it's like if you can break that one thing, it's, oh, it's pretty much game over. Um, so. When we talk to data flow mappings, uh, we're not talking about, uh, I know I don't mean to confuse you with this, but we're not talking about necessarily how the data moves from country to country, although crossing borders is definitely part of something you need to account for under GDPR. Um, what we're really talking about is when you're ingesting this data, um, I got it from this site via that cookie, it went into this repository, which is or is not encrypted, right? So basically mapping your application from input to storage, right? All the way through your architecture. Did it get kicked off into some analytics or big data pipeline somewhere, right? So don't, now do I have two copies of it or do I have 10 copies of it, right? Well, it's in this database. Did some other service pull it out of that database to use it for something else? And now there's n more copies of it, right? Um, pardon me. Uh, Many client-side applications will send data directly to third-party partners, right? If it's an SDK or JavaScript or something, it's just gonna send it out there into the world, never even touching your servers, and you have to be mindful of that. Um, and then where physically or geographically the, the data is actually being stored. Um, not only that, but you may, getting back to the second to last point, you may actually have back-end things that share data as well, right? You have partners or whatever. Maybe your CRM systems or something like that are populated by a back-end data store. Um, in order to get any sort of, as security practitioners, you know this already, right? You can't do anything if there's not proper documentation and proper change control, because it's just herding cats at that point, right? So in order for me to maintain data flow mappings, right, I need to know if you add a new piece of JavaScript. I need to know if you add a new cookie and what that's used for. I need to know if you add a new SDK into our mobile application. I need to know if you're adding some sort of backend a data sharing pipeline with another company or with the analytics teams or whatever, right? Uh, the data scientists. All those things now force me as a leader to say, you have to do change control. It's no longer an optional thing for you, right? I need at least these minimum requirements for you to even do my job. If I can't do my job, company loses 4% of revenue, right? 
It's not even a, a passionate argument at that point, right? It's a factual statement. So knowing this and knowing how hard this can be, luckily we're an AWS shop. So some of the things for us are, are easier than maybe in a conventional uh, infrastructure. I can go into an, uh, a web console and I can say, show me all the databases that I have. Cool, there's all the table names, right? Done, to a degree, right? But then I have to map the input to the table name and figure out like, okay, so if I get rid of this, does that mean that data is divorced from, from its input source and no longer needing to be retained, right? Things like that. So luckily I have uh, a couple hardworking people on my team who we, we basically got together and uh, Johnny and Vishal, who are both hanging out here for some reason, uh, <laughs> uh, worked with the, I worked with these two guys to, to kind of, how are we gonna, how are we gonna map out all of our applications, right? So it's similar to a static versus dynamic code analysis problem where basically you can say, okay, well I have the front end application. I can run burp suite and with Johnny's help, uh, we modified this parameterizer um, library to basically be able to say, here are all the quests and here are all the pieces of data that went in that request, right? So we can say every path and every parameter now that comes out of one of our applications, right? And we can store that and he's gonna be doing it anyway, right? It's not even really much more burden on him to collect it, right? Because he's gonna be testing out all the new features and everything. So he runs that, he creates a CSV. That's basically what you're seeing there, right? Um, of all the paths and all the parameters. Secondarily, I say, okay, well, that's similar to like doing dynamic testing where unless you exercise all the code paths under all the variants, you're not gonna get a full picture of it, right? So then you say, okay, well, I could do static code analysis, drawing an analogy to that, which would be me going in and reading the code, parsing the code somehow and saying, let me see every route and every get, post, put parameter that, that, that might be there, right? And I'm gonna map those out, right? So if I put those two together, I might have a reasonably good picture of what the application looks like, right? But again, there's still possibilities, like when you parse static code, um, there might be a late loading code or there might be, you're not, for some reason, you're not getting everything that you need to for some reason. Something's dynamically generated and you don't see that in the static code, whatever the case may be. So you still run the possibility of missing things. Um, to give you an idea of what we did, so we, we, we took like, uh, our developers use something called Swagger, which is basically an API testing kind of validation thing where basically they say, if I send a request to this endpoint, I expect to get something back, right? And they basically map it out. Say, I, want, I send this request, I should get something, that response that looks something like this, right? So I say, okay, there's a third point of validation. That's what the developers think should be there, right? So I say, okay, let me take this and create a sec a, a f machine parsable files out of all of them, right? And merge them together and see what I come up with, right? So uh, I, I basically just used a custom writ written Python script. It's not really that hard to mash CSVs or JSON together or whatever, right? So we came up with something. This is just a partial list and redacted, right? Because I don't want to map out our full API for you guys. But um, you can see here, uh, there's a couple things. So I zoomed in a little bit, but the gist of it is, this is api.gotinder.com. That's the thing that powers all of our backend, right? Like that's when all of our client apps call to that, right? So you'll notice there are different shapes and different colors, right? Generally speaking, the, the roundish shapes are actually paths, path elements, right? The squares are actually uh, parameters that are passed in. So I can look in here and I can say like, you know, I can follow paths from the, from the API and, and the thing, the colors are actually a melding of colors. Um, so basically like yellow and blue make green kind of thing, right? So I said, if it came in from the work that Johnny and Vishal did to map out the application, it's one color. If it was in the, if it was dynamic or if it was statically found by reading the routes files or some other way, I, I add those two colors together, right? So it's like inherently I can look at it and say, well, if it's green, then that means it was yellow or yeah, if it was yellow and blue at one point, right? So that, that's the only way green would have showed up. If, it, if it's not in that file, but it's in another file, it would merge that color together and it would come out with a different output color. If it was all in all three, then I would have yet another color, right? So it's sort of inherently, I know how much I can trust that that's a thorough representation of it. So another sort of side win is I can go back to the developers and say, hey, your swagger file's out of date, right? I, I have proof that it is because of dynamically when I'm testing the app, it doesn't look like that's supposed to, right? Or, or vice versa, right? Um, so anyway, so 
This is just using a library called GraphViz. Um, it's a pretty common library. But this goes on for miles. I can't, I can't even get it close to on one screen, right? The, the, the breadth of, of possible routes is just is too wide. So I zoomed in here and basically kind of give you an idea. Like uh, in Tinder, you have the idea of like you left swipe or pass on somewhere or you right swipe and you like them, right? So in the pass path, then we can drop down and you can see like um, these are from obviously from code or something because they have uh, placeholder values or variables there, right? So they're saying uh, it's going to be a user ID. Well, there was another path that actually showed that the user ID was a numeric value of 24 characters, or alpha, sorry, a hex value of 24 characters, right? Uh, V2 would actually merge those two things together and say it's a user ID of this length, but right now I treat them separately. Um, anyway, so the parameter being passed in on that path would be user ID and then the XAuth token, which would be the authentication and stuff like that. There'll be a body for that, and then there's a, a super, uh, which is another parameter. Um, it's nerve-wracking when people take pictures of you. You don't know, like, should I stop and pose a model up here or what? Anyhow, um, so that's how we did it, right? We, we basically were able to merge all three of these things together that we basically already had with a little bit of scripting. And, and now I, if an auditor came in and said, show me, how, show me what your API looks like, I'd just show them that and say, there you go, it's done, right? And I can automate that if I want to and say, like, hey, well, some, it's automatic to me because I can say, hey, Johnny or Vishal, next time you guys uh, test this application, make sure you run the parameterizer to collect all of the, all of the input and I'll just merge them back together again with very minimal effort, right? So uh, what's not shown here, and because, partly because I'm not crazy, is, is the actual version of this includes all the backend data stores, right? So if I have, I don't know, let's say it's uh, your first name, right? I will actually map your first name into each of the data stores on my back end, everywhere first name is stored. Taking that to the next level, you say, okay, I know that the first name isn't in all of these data stores because of this request directly, right? What most likely happened is it got, came in through this request, ended up in that data store, and something else copied it out of that data store. So I can actually map it laterally as well, right? And say, okay, well, uh, it wasn't directly dropped in there, but it was moved around in my environment, and I can start to actually do end-to-end -end data flow mappings, right? When things change, I can say, ooh, change. What does that mean? Can I get rid of that piece of data now? Because we're not collecting it. It's not being used anymore, whatever the case is, right? Um, also, I can see when somebody slips something in there that they didn't tell us about, right? It's reinforcing the change control paradigm of uh, having visibility into what, what your environment looks like. Um, Limiting third-party exposure. Obviously, you don't want to be overexposed here like Borat. Uh, basically, because your partners are also almost guaranteed to need to be GDPR compliant, just by the fact that you might be sharing data on EU residents with them automatically draws them in there, right? So you're going to have to make sure all your contracts have GDPR uh, privacy addendums included in them saying, yes, we will be GDPR compliant with your data, right? This means that all of the wins that you get from GDPR as a security leader or, or part of a security team, uh, you inherit from them as well, or, or you place on them as well, right? So they have to do the same things that you do, which include limiting data, encrypting data, that sort of stuff, right? Tracking it. Uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll watch a presentation similar to this, and, and they'll, they'll reduce the, the data they're collecting and, and take care of it as a good data stewards. Um, Obviously, if you find that they are not compliant at some point, it's an automatic contract breach. Now, you can leverage that however you want, right? But it's clearly stated it is a contract term, and if, they do, if they're not compliant, well, you know, it may ins insulate you from a liability standpoint to some point, but you might use it for other purposes. Well, like, I don't really want to use that vendor or something, right? Uh, it also depends on how much leverage, as most of these contract things do, how much leverage you have in the, in the relationship, right? Like, if Google's not going to care if I stop using them most nine times out of ten, right? But some small... Uh, dev shop in San Francisco is probably going to care if they lose our business, right? Um, data cleanup. So one of the things as a, as a security practitioner I w always hate would be to, to lose data that I didn't need to have in the first place. To have to do a data breach notification on data I didn't intend to use anymore anyway. An example of that, uh, one time I had a, as a, as a young application security tester, I had the CTO come over to my desk and I said, hey, I want to show you something, right? And it was a login page for an application. And I proceeded to dump a credit card base, uh, database via SQL injection right there in front of him. And I said, he's like, what's that? I'm like, that's the credit card database. He goes, no, that's the old credit card database. I said, why do we have an old credit card database? I don't know. We just never cleaned it up. I'm like, 
Now, would you want to suffer a data breach over data you were never even using? Like it just was of no use to you anymore? I wouldn't want to, right? The PR hit's still going to be there, right? The potential for legal liability is still, still there, but you didn't want it in the first place, right? So you can enforce that, again, with that sort of threat of the 4% loss of revenue, right? Um, also, data retention policies, right? So uh, there are specific guidelines that you'll have to go through with your legal teams to figure out what the right numbers are for you, but what, what do you do? How long do you retain data after um, the, the user closes their account, right? In a purist world, we say the day they close their account, it should be gone, right? There are technical limitations to that, right? Uh, some systems are just so big and diverse that it, it might actually physically take more than a day for all the batch jobs to run to clean all that stuff up, right? Nothing happens instantaneously. Um, so is it a day? Is it a month? Is it a week? Is it a year, right? Um, there are also competing interests that we'll talk about later, um, which might force you to retain data that you didn't want to, but you need to iron all those things out and communicate them to your developers, right? Um, also makes things like retention or reactivation tracking difficult, right? If you signed up with this email address or this phone number and you cancel your account and then you come back six months later, I can't tell that you're a reactivation. Now from a security standpoint, nobody cares about that. From a business standpoint, they absolutely care about that, right? Oh, we were able to you know, get this guy to resubscribe by sending him an email or whatever, right? Well, we don't have the email anymore. I can't even remarket. I, I may not be able to necessarily market to my previous customers anymore, right? Like, oh, hey, we, we understood you didn't like the pricing. We changed the pricing now. Here, sign up again. If I can't retain the data, I can't do that sort of thing, right? Um, yeah, again, we want to try to eliminate data that we don't need, um, minimize the data that we keep, and uh, effectively try to eliminate the unnecessary losses, right? Um, we also want to limit the number of places that we store data, the number of partners that we share data with, right, to minimize our exposure. Um, because of the requirements of sort of taking reasonable means or, or you know, state of the art, blah, 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 to protect user data, if you're not doing things like deleting data that you're not supposed to have, if you're not anonymizing data that you're storing, if you're not doing what they call pseudon pseudonymization, which uh, one example of would be like hashing of something, like a hashing their phone numbers instead of keeping the raw phone number, that would be pseudonymization or something, it's basically a pseudonym, right? So something that is representative of something else but not a direct, uh, you know, uh, tie. O or encrypting data. Um, if you're doing these things, if somebody does break in, right, there's a good chance that that break in is going to be less impactful, right? If I'm properly encrypting the data and I can somehow protect the key, uh, used to encrypt it, then guess what? It's not even a data breach under GDPR. I don't have to send out notifications if I, somebody stole a bunch of your encrypted data. Um, now, pseudonymization is sort of like a compromise position where you can't quite protect it the way you want to, but you need to do something. Uh, a good case for that might be uh, when we dive into this, we realize there are databases that just don't lend themselves to being encrypted uh, at a field level, right? So like if you think about Elasticsearch or a fully... Uh, indexed database, right? I want to search on every field. It's not theoretically, but it's practically impossible to search on encrypted data. You, you just can't do it, right? It, the the uh, efficiencies of storing data in those databases all go away if you start doing things like that, right? And your developers will just, like, I'm not doing it. It doesn't make any sense, right? So uh, the less data you have, the less motivation, obviously, there are for people to break in, right? And the better, the better job you do of storing it internally, the, the, the less the, the impact would be if they do break in. Uh, getting to this down, download portal. So basically, if you think about it, if you have any kind of scale at all, you're going to need to create a portal so people can say, I want you to show me all the data you have on me. Under GDPR, you have to be able to do that, right? And most places are going to want to make it like nice and presentable. But there's a requirement under GDPR, uh, GDPR that it's basically machine readable right? It's, it's subject to interpretation on what that means. Like, uh, we initially had an HTML form, and I said, while technically machine readable, most developers would say no, right? If you try to parse HTML, everybody knows there's, it's a pain in the butt, right? But JSON, you know, might be a better option for that, right? And you could actually use a, you could create a pretty JSON or a pretty HTML page based off of the JSON blob that you're going to give people as well. The idea is that, like, I could go, let's say, let's say, uh, Friendster was still a thing or, or MySpace was still a thing. Uh, and, and I said, I don't want to be a Facebook customer. 
I'm supposed to be able to export my data and give it to MySpace or, or Friendster or some other social network, and they're supposed to be able to ingest it and basically make me a consumer there. That's, that's, how poor, that's the portability aspect of it, right? Um, but anyway, it, it's a portal that gets, lets me download all of the data that you have on me. So as an attacker, if I can break one thing in your, in your environment, I'll take the thing that gives me all of the data that you have on your users, right? Access control problems here are just, it's, it's game over, right? It, it, I can sit there, if I can, if I can somehow break access control at this portal, I can just get all of the data that you have on all of the users. Um, so again, you have basically, you know, more or less two choices, but three choices of how you store your data, right? You can store it in plain text, which is no protection at all. You can encrypt it or pseudonym, pseudonym <laughs> I can't say this word, pseudonymization, pseudonymize it, uh, which offers some protection, right? Um, if, you, it, if you realize that uh, database encryption is, is flawed in the fact that, generally speaking, at some point you have a server talking to a database, and at some point that process running on that server that's talking to the database has to access the key in memory. So if I break in there and I have suitable access to the box, I can, if I have RCE, I can probably read that key out of memory anyway. So did you actually accomplish something? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, but anonymization under GDPR, true anonymization, means there's no way to get from A to B. There's, there's literally no linkage there anymore, right? So uh, you have to think about how you map users' data across different data stores. And maybe you put in uh, sort of a, as an example, like a pseudonym table where you have the external user ID and an internal user ID. And as soon as they're gone, you delete that connection. And now I can't tell user A on the inside was the same person as user A on the outside, right? Um, that's up to you how you want to approach that, but those are your three options, basically. Um, as I said, GDPR lends itself to better vendors because they have to apply these same standards to their uh, environments. Um, they also need to be able to purge the data that you give them upon your request, right? So I say, I'm no longer doing business with you. You must get rid of this. They have to tell you what, what they're doing. Your lawyer should already cover this, but if they're sharing the data with other third parties as well. Um, they should encrypt or anonymize the data, right? Obviously, because that's part of their GDPR requirements as well. Um, because they now inherit those security, uh, even be it that they're vague, they inherit those security requirements. You could enforce those on them as well, right? And say, what are you doing to reasonably meet this vague standard, right? Um, there are some exceptions. Um, so one example that we ran across was Brazil. So apparently Brazil wants you to keep data for a year after people delete it. And I think this is generally for servicing law enforcement requests or something like that. But that's obviously in direct conflict with GDPR that wants us to get rid of data as soon as we no longer have a you know, legitimate business use for it, right? Um, and then subject to some other uh, criteria. Uh, if you have a, a platform where abuse between like IRL, like in real life, abuse between two people might happen and there's actually going to be investigations and you want to be able to help law enforcement with that, you're going to have concerns like, well, can I retain their data? What if the bad guy just deletes their account? Am I supposed to get rid of it immediately? Right? I, now I can't help law enforcement, right? Or maybe you, maybe you don't want to help law enforcement. That's up to you, right? Uh, as, a, as a company. Um, how do you ban a user if you can't retain their data? I can't say Bob Smith at gmail.com was a bad user. We got rid of him. Now we want to ban him forever. How can I ban him if I can't keep his personal information, right? Uh, or his IP address, right? Maybe he changes his email address, but now I need to know that Bob Smith was at that IP. That's most likely Bob Smith's house, that sort of thing, right? Um, luckily, uh, GDPR does have what they consider greater good exceptions, right? As a sort of a, uh, a blanket statement. So if it, first of all, you can't be compelled to break another law to meet GDPR, right? Um, so if, if it's a law in Brazil and you can say, hey, well, I couldn't do that because your EU residents, you know, were also subject to Brazilian law for whatever reason, I guess I got to keep your data. Right? I, gotta, I guess I got to keep the data, right? Also things like anti-spam and abuse uh, retention is allowed, right? So that would be for the greater good to protect the, the community as a whole, right? Um, so again, not a lawyer, but y these are the kind of details that you need to iron out with your legal team or seek outside counsel about if you don't have uh, lawyers at your disposal. Um, that's about it. I Hopefully, I'm doing all right on time. Um, this is my contact information, and as with any company, we're hiring in security, so 
Um, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Green Jacket. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you are referring you using AWS, and um, like if you take any snapshot of your RDS or stuff like that, if I'm a EU, like EU citizen, <laughs> so I can come to you and yes, say, but are you an EU resident? Not anymore, but I can maybe. <laughs> we don't care about how your data okay. is handled anymore. Well, uh, so how will you do? Because basically, my information are also in those backups and it's really hard to get rid of them? That's a real fun question. Yeah, what do you do with backups, right? That, um, you're going to back up data from somebody today, right? And they're going to delete their account. Now what do you do? You have to mount a backup to delete a row, right? There are things like that that, that are real challenges from an engineering standpoint, like what do we do, right? Um, I think there are things that you would, cl I think you, I'm not a lawyer, I think you would try to make the argument that that was a necessar necessary thing and an undue burden on your company to make me go through there, right? But as an added step, I would say encrypt it, tightly protect the key, and say, you know, we did as much as we could. We needed to retain the data. We put this special key. I took it offline or something. It's, 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 on, the, you know, it's on the CEO's desk or something like that, right? Uh, you can take the approach, like with most compliance things, of compensating controls, right? What could I do to make the argument that although I had to retain this data at effectively in violation of this directive uh, or regulation, um, I've taken extraordinary steps to make sure that that wasn't going to be an issue. That's, that's the approach I would suggest that most people are going to take. Yeah, I suppose, because like same thing, if you come back from a disaster recovery, if you had like such requests during just before the disaster recovery, so basically like you lost the last two hours, you'd probably re put online back some data that you were supposed to erase. <laughs> right. So so if you think about it, you could if you did daily backups, you could say, okay, they deleted today. I'm going to make a backup today, and everybody's data prior to today is lost. Right. If you weren't in today's backup. But we all know how backups can work sometimes, that you get corrupted backup. You don't know it until you try to load it, and then you have problems, depending on the formats that we're talking about. But yeah, that's, that presents a real problem. Yeah. I have no solution. <laughs> I was just asking. I would go the compensating control route would probably be the best. I mean, you, as with any legal thing, I think that it's up to your legal department to figure out what is the right way to meet with the spirit, if not the letter of the law. So, so I have two questions. So number one, um, can you talk a bit more about what the dependencies are for, for companies that are based uh, like in North America vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, this regulation? Obviously, they do business in Europe or they have uh, EU citizen data, then even though they're based in the U.S., they have uh, some, some impact is on them, right? And the second question is, you mentioned in, earlier in your presentation about how you're kind of combining dynamic and static analysis and building out these these nice graphs. Um, I was wondering what you use to actually drive the. Um, you're basically capturing all of the the requests, right, and the responses, and saying, okay, here's what we touch. But how do you actually make it actually exercise the entire um, application so that you get the full code coverage? I hope that makes sense. But you have to have a, an engine to actually click on every particular button so that you can actually do your, your graph building. So if you could talk about to that, that, that's an interesting topic as well. So two questions. So if you process data on EU residents, you, you must comply with GDPR. There's, that's the scope. It doesn't matter what country you're in, it's a matter of where the people are residents, right? Uh, the second part, um, I, I apologize if the explanation wasn't clear, but basically, um, we use different sources, so they come in different formats, but essentially I have, a, I have a URL, right? And I parse out the different pieces of it, and I say, make this a hierarchy of this, make this a, a child of that, right? And just, until I get down to the point where I say, okay, this is, this is a parameter now. Um, the library that I use to draw the graphs dynamically is called GraphViz, um, spelled as you would imagine, graph plus V-I-Z. Um, Oh. So you're not just manually doing, you know, the 
you know, thousand million variants that right. that application can encounter. So I say, Johnny and Vishal, could you please make sure you exercise every possible path in our application? No. Um, what I tried to allude to earlier was that you can't, right? You're, you're not going to, realistically. You might even have A-B tests that, you know, you signed up as one user, you signed up another user. Guess what? They don't see the same experience. And you don't even have that other button to click, right? So you have to combine both static and dynamic analysis of uh, the client software, or maybe even the back end, uh, to, to, to put together a more complete picture. Uh, that's why I said we also incorporated Swagger, which is what the, the or the API documentation even, right, that the, that the uh, developers maintain, and we mashed all those things together. We looked for conflicts, resolved conflicts, and then tried to fix the conflicts at the source, and then we uh, said, okay, this looks like the cleanest result, most thorough result we could find, right? So there is no magic answer to that. Yeah, so I, I, I like the approach that you have mapping your API and that kind of stuff, but as far, can you talk to, about continuously monitoring and, and, and getting the updated changes regarding that? And then what, on a follow-on of that of is when the auditors, or I don't think they're really gonna be auditors, they're gonna actually be investigators come in to investigate that you're non-compliance or you've got a, or you got a breach or whatever. Do you think they're going to care about how how you mapped it out and that you have these pretty diagrams, or are they actually going to use forensics tools to tear your place apart to find where your data's at? And because it's it has to be presentable to court if it does go to court, so you have to have those type of uh, ways of preserving and to finding that data. Um, so I just want to talk about those kind of key points, continuous monitoring, and uh, forensically finding the data. So because I'm drawing on different information sources to complete the CSVs, what the CSVs might be better for them to use anyways in the graph, but I like having the graph. It makes me happy. Um, the, the, because I'm drawing on those and uh, different sources, uh, some of the sources are in GitHub, so I can literally just watch that file and see if it changes, right? Or I can just pull it periodically. Uh, maybe Johnny Vishal or someone on our AppSec team is, is testing the application and I say, okay, every time you're done, you drop that, drop your output from the dynamic test into this folder and I'll just have a job that runs up and mashes them all together automatically and generates it for me, right? Um, there's a little bit of showmanship in the graph and in, in, in the, the fact that you have this information. You, you do eventually need to have data flow mappings. How you get, derive at that and what tools you use to store that, I was just kind of showing a way you could do it on the cheap for free, right? Uh, we, there are uh, products like OneTrust that actually are professional products geared around uh, storing these type of data mappings, but this is something homegrown. And I think if, a, if an auditor comes in and they don't have an ax to grind, right? They're not specifically making, trying to make sure that they find something. You know, you show them that I'm doing due diligence, right? Here's a process that I have that shows me all of this and I'm watching and monitoring for changes in our data collection and storage, right? I think that's a big win and it might get them to stop looking, right? It's kind of like, hey, our house is in order. You don't need to go looking under every, every nook and cranny or under every rock for, for, a, for a problem, right? Is it, is it enough? That remains to be seen. Can I talk to my legal team and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Does this, is this a defensible position for the company to be in? They may say yes, they may say no, you need to you know, put some more uh, work into it, right? Um, I think an, an auditor of anything can find a problem if they want to, right? Is it a, is it a gross negligent thing or is it a, uh, you did due diligence, you did your best and you still fell short? That's a different standard, right? Um, and, and I think um, what ends up happening, I think uh, historically, if you're grossly negligent, you face a much harsher ramification. You may still face something even though you did best effort, right? Um, but it's generally minimized, right? They, you, they, the company took it seriously, their obligations, they tried to meet them, and maybe they fell short, but you know, they take that into account, I think, generally. You had a question, right? Yeah. So are you gonna, the BERT parameterizer that you guys wrote, are you gonna open source that or anything like that to help other companies? So I can show you the slide again, just so if anybody wanted to use that. We actually did a custom modification to this. We didn't actually, uh, we took this because it was a very good starting point. It was like 90% of where we wanted to be or so, right? And we just wrote some, some custom stuff in there to make it fit our purpose. I think it was probably around the output, if I remember. 
right? So all we did was tweak it so we could actually get the CSV output because that was easier to, to munch. But out of the box, that's ready to go for you, more or less, if you can take the JSON or XML that it was already outputting. Right, and then we and then we wrote some custom code that I'm not ready to like. I don't even know how useful you would find it, but to merge all those things together, Swagger files and API documentation and CSVs, and mash them all together and resolve the conflicts and create the tree. I could probably talk to you and give it to you if you really want. It's not a a major, large scale project. I don't know if anybody was really interested in it, but if so, I can talk to me. I could probably give you a, a good start on it at least. Any other questions? Am I being kicked out yet? A uh, quick one, um, say company A, I'm a user of company A using Salesforce. How do I request a data purge from company A and Salesforce? Who has the liability and how the flow works? Uh, that's number one. The comment, um, one comment is the banking industry, they need to retain uh, your records and personal info for seven year uh, or so, so they don't even, right now, they don't even start working on GDPR. They have few more years before they start deleting uh, data more than seven year old if they have, so thanks. So uh, it's a chain of responsibility, right? So if, if I'm company, if I'm company A and, you, and, I, and I've shared, sorry, if I'm a user and I've shared my data with company A, right? The responsibility on, uh, from my perspective is on company A, right? They need to delete my data or, or give it to me when, when I requested it, right? Um, from co company A's perspective, company B has that obligation to them, right? So they have to, to treat that data in accordance. So it's sort of a transitive responsibility. Like they inherit that responsibility by the fact that they're processing data for you. They have... Uh, two specific terminologies of user of companies or entities in, on GDPR. One's a processor and another is an aggregator, right? Uh, and a controller, sorry. Uh, is, is that a third or, or just I misquoted one of them? Okay, so it's a processor and a, and a controller, yeah. right? And so, and they, and they, so, so yeah, and so they have different spelled out obligations uh, for each of those entity types. Um, was there, what was the other, was there something else? Uh, Oh, banking, I mean, again, if you're legally compelled to retain data, they can't make you keep it beyond that, right? No, nobody can force you to be a criminal that's entrapment, <laughs> right? At least in this country, anyway. Um, now, there, there probably will be some unthought of conflicts that will come up like that, right? Like um, earnings reports that, I guess those shouldn't really have, stock market data probably shouldn't have personal information on the, but, but an interesting point that we came across was, uh, Vendors, the vendors that we use, we have to purge some of their information because it might have personal information uh, of the vendors. I'm like, so I have to delete emails from vendors from, you know, N years ago or whatever because I have to met, meet GDPR or employee data, right? It has HR employee uh, implications as well. I, I would suppose that means that that is only if they are an EU resident, I would assume, right? And I guess that the same would go with your with your vendor. Although, good luck on figuring out whether or not your vendor is an EU resident or not. Keeping data on another human person, it's excluded from GDPR. Okay, good to know. It's specifically a company to a, a living human. So, so my question on that would be, I am the company, right? I am, if it's, if it's Tony Trummer and I'm holding your data, that's one thing, right? But as an employee of Tinder, I'm now Tinder, I would assume, right? Because right? otherwise my, my data science guys are like, cool, I can hold all the data for one because I'm Bob and I'm going to hold all the data. You know, it's, it's my data. Sorry. The, the big issue is uh, that is not defined in GDPR and any of the working groups is I'm a salesperson. I take customer data from the company database put it in my contact information, I collect the kid's birth date so I can call the customer to say, say happy birthday to your son. Now does that data fall under GDPR and what happens if that guy's notebook or you know laptop is stolen and it's not encrypted? It's a whole can of worms that nobody knows about uh, because there's no precedent yet. 
Yeah, we already know salespeople are a lawless bunch, right? So I, good luck with them. But yeah, I mean, it raises interesting questions about like tracking the data that employees might put on their laptops and, you know, take on vacation with them and then not come back or something like that, right? There's all kinds of interesting questions about that, right? So as, as a model, right, we try to push everything. So like if you're someone who's pulling data out of our production systems, that needs to stop, right? First of all, we have kind of a policy where it's like we don't want engineers to have access to personal information as much as possible anyways. Realizing that some people like in maybe the analytics or data science teams, maybe it's unavoidable in some things. That's like how they have to do their job, right? Um, but when it's not, or, or if it is and we can find a better way for them to do it that doesn't, you know, uh, maybe we can change the, you know, you, you change the client server model in some way where more of it can stay on the server and less can come down to your client, right? Um, test data as an example, like developers, they're like, oh, I got a whole bunch of test data it's sitting right there in the production database. I'll pull it out, right? Like, let's, we got to stop doing that so that, you know, that doesn't walk off. You know, oh, it's just, I had a bunch, I had a million or so people's, you know, personal information on my laptop because I was running a local instance and I wanted to test it there. That can't, can't persist, right? Okay, I guess I'm done. Oh, sorry. Do I have time for one more? Yeah, we'll squeeze it in. Last question. I just had a question about the, your very exhaustive data maps. So you're uh, trying to identify all the data you use and how the, the data flows through your applications. Um, are you intending to implement GDPR controls on all that data or just the personal data subset? And if it's just the personal data subset, how are you identifying it from that huge map? So uh, it's probably more easily identified on the uh, CSV, to be honest with you, right? So I can actually... I could pair it out, right? So I could, I could literally say like for th things that I know, for example, like the auth token, uh, oh, no, maybe that's not a great example. Uh, somebody might say that's personal information or something, but like, um, I don't know. Uh, let's say there's a, a clearly non, hypothetical, clearly non-personally identifiable or person, personal, there's a data point that's not personal information. It's clearly in there. I can literally just squeeze that out and minimize that actual graph to just be that information. The problem, the one problem is about, like you might say, okay, I'll take a whitelist approach. If it's a date of birth, if it's this, this, and this, you're going to miss something eventually because someone's going to misspell date of birth or they're going to do a date underscore of underscore birth or something like that. So it's probably easier to eliminate uh, parameters once you know they're not personal information than it is to... Basically having to manually inspect the output for things that look like personal data and then you go backtrack and look at the flow and, and determine which databases are involved in that flow and those are the ones that you have to apply controls to. Is that what you're doing? Well, yeah, if you want to, if you want to minimize the, the graph, then you'd need to do that, yeah, for sure. Okay. I don't know that there's an easy way around that. Uh, you, could, you can try regex parsing and stuff like that to say, like, does this match uh, a phone number? There are certain structured data elements that are, are, that are going to be easy to find, date of birth and phone number, potentially, right? There's a limited range of what those are going to look like. Whereas someone's name's a little bit harder and then other addresses get a little bit looser, you know, things like that. So, uh, good. All right, thank you, Tony. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day.